to preach, to share, all right? Uh, welcome this morning. If you're new, I'm Lauren. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, just last week, we started this series about some of the things that maybe are a little bit, um, can I say scary about God? If we look at it from the wrong perspective. And one of the things that we're trying to do through this series is to get us to say, okay, these aren't really scary things. Like sometimes they put us on the wrong side of God because we look at it and we go, man, I don't understand this, but hopefully this will cause us to look back at God and go, okay, I don't get it, I don't like it, and, but you're still a good God. You're still a God that is full of glory. And last week we talked about in particular times when we pray and God says, no, no, it's not going to happen. Quit talking to me, end of discussion, that's it. And sometimes for us, that, that's hard to hear. And I thank you guys, some of you guys, for some of the feedback last week. I, I know you guys have heard me say this before. I hate just hearing good sermon. It's like an attaboy on the way out the door. You know, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? But this past week, some of you guys shared some like really important things. And, and I know some of you guys are going through what it feels like to have no for an answer. And last week's sermon doesn't give you something that changes that feeling, does it? It's still hard to take a no for an answer. It's still, God, why? Why no? But hopefully it gives us something that we can go back to and say, in spite of the fact that I don't feel great right now, in spite of the fact that I wish my circumstances were different, I'm going to go back to the same God that I trusted when things were going good, knowing that he is a God that is full of glory. And so we're going to kind of keep trying to explore what that looks like. Um, today, something got me thinking this past week in a different kind of way. And I'm sharing it from a little bit different perspective because I studied for a couple of weeks thinking I was going to, to preach from a a different text than where we're going this morning. But I got to thinking about a text, and everybody knows that text. Like, it's a little too familiar. This one is still familiar, but I was reading it again in my devotions this week, and I, that's it right there. That's it. That's what God wants me to talk about. So if you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua, if you don't have a Bible this morning, there's a black one in the pew right in front of you. Just grab that. Uh, if you don't have one at home, take it with you. It's our gift to you on the 4th of July. You can have it. Continue to read it, um, but take it with you. Turn to the book of Joshua, and this morning we're going to continue this idea of a God that is full of glory. We're going to be looking, though, about what that looks like in particular. Because God's glory is all of his perfections. It's all of what makes him special, unique. And we're going to look at, like, kind of, kind of try and break these things down and, and look at what in particular is it that we can hold on to about God and his attributes that we can take with us, okay? So Joshua, and we're going to be, I'm going to be telling a little bit of the story just as we go along to get us some of the background so uh, if you want to, turn to Joshua chapter 4, but again, I'm going to give you some background, so we're going to kind of walk our way through this. Israel had spent 40 years wandering around because some people said, you know, we're supposed to be going into this land, but there's a lot of big people in that land. And there's just playing a lot of people in that land, and they got a lot of defenses in that land, so yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. God said, all right, walk around for 40 years and see if you change your mind. The problem was, during those 40 years, everybody who said no, 20 years and up, would die. And so they wandered around for 40 years. I don't, I, have you wandered around for a week in the wilderness? 40 years, God leading them in the wilderness. Now, some of the cool stuff that happened, he provided water, he provided food for them, like their clothes didn't wear out, their sandals didn't wear out. They had a lot of cool stuff going on, but one by one, they die. Until all that's left now is this new generation, and they're ready to go into the promised land. 
And finally, they're standing at the edge of the Jordan. They look across and they go, okay, this is the place that we're going to go into. Now, for whatever reason, Joshua does the same thing that Moses did. He sends in two spies. Check out the land. They come back. This time, what do they say? Lots of people, big people, good land, lots of fortified cities. But God's given us this land. Let's go in. Let's take the land. And so as they're getting ready to go, God explains to Joshua. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get get the, the, the leaders together, and I want you, first of all, to take the ark into the middle of the river. And when they begin to step foot into the middle of the river, the river's going to part. It's going to be just like the Red Sea, and you're going to walk across on dry land. And so they follow the, the, again, this is just the military this time. This isn't everybody. Just the military follow in. The, the waters part. They walk through on dry land, and they get to the other side. And imagine, again, being like, here's a new generation. They didn't see the first time that God did this. Now they're seeing this, and they're going, this is crazy. Water standing up a long ways away. We're walking across on dry land. Get to the other side, and what happens? Whoosh, all the water comes back. And then it's kind of like, okay, this is for real. Like we're stuck on the other side of the river now. It's like the burn the ships and never go back thing. Here we are. We are supposed to go in, and we are supposed to take this land. There's no returning now. And in Joshua chapter 4, beginning in verse 20, these 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Why did God do that thing going across the Jordan? Just to impress the people that he could move water and hold it up for a while. And he, man, he's a strong God. No, why did God say he did that? So the people would know he was real, but for the Israelites in particular, that they would learn to fear God. As they go into the promised land, he wants them to understand he is the God that they should be worshiping. And so all these men walk across on dry land. They, they hear what Joshua says. They turn around. Okay, let's go. Uh, not yet. First of all, we have to do some business. All right, if you read your text, I'll let you read your text, but there's a little, a little process that all the men have to go through. Okay? All the guys who are of military fighting age have to go through a fairly humbling experience. And they... All go through it together. Now, I don't know why this didn't happen as they're wandering around for 40 years. My guess is you wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. You probably don't want to be doing this. All right, Read your text. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so they, they all heal up from this process. Okay? Some of you guys are getting it now. Yes. I'll let moms and dads figure out how to explain that later. But they all heal up from this process, and then they are able to celebrate Passover together. Now, again, remembering Passover, what is that about? It's about God's deliverance of the nation of Israel. All of the Egyptians had their firstborn killed, every single one of them. But all of the Israelites who placed blood on their doorpost, were passed over. They didn't experience that. Now, the Israelites who didn't believe God, guess what? Same experience as the Egyptians. But those Israelites who trusted God, they experienced that. So this is in memory of that, and they have Passover together. And then, this is it. As they celebrate the Passover together for the first time, since they're wandering around in the wilderness... No more manna. No more manna burgers. No more manna waffles. If you guys know Keith Green, he had a great song about that. 
No more having to figure out manna recipes. Because for the first time, they had this Passover with food that was from the promised land. And God says, that's it. I don't have to provide this food anymore. You're going to enter into a land that is flowing with milk and honey. This is it. And so as they celebrate all of this, they get ready to go in and to do what God's asking them to do. And so we'll jump to Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Um, Josh, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. All right, here we go. Command is just walk. Just walk. We've been walking for 40 years. We're ready to do battle. God says, just walk. Start the first day. Get up early. Walk. But here's, here's an important detail. Walk in silence. Now imagine, and there's been some guesses as to how big this army is. There were 2 million Israelites, but the guess is, 2 million probably plus, but the guess is probably about 40,000 that are men of war. 40,000 guys. Somewhere between a Mariners game and a baseball game. In complete silence. As they walk around the city the first day. Go back to their camp. What's the plan for the second day? Walk in silence. They do that for six days. I love the, again, sorry, I, I use these weird illustrations, but I love the Veggie Tales part of this, where the, guy, the little P up on the wall is watching these guys walk around. He's like, come on, walk around the city, but you're not going to break my wall down. And so they're watching, you know, all the people inside the city, they're watching what's going on. The Israelites walk around for six days, and on the seventh day, they probably have to get up a little bit early because you've got to do this thing seven times. Again, that's why there's not two million people. Can you imagine two million people going around the city seven times? It takes forever. But even 40,000 guys walking around the city. And they walk around for seven times. And then they're told to shout. Why are they told to shout? I, I always thought, okay, this, forgive me for being a little too Baptist here. <laughs> I always thought it was because the charismatics wanted to use this as something to be able to say, hey, shout, okay? <laughs> but, but Joshua, look at verse 10. Joshua commanded the people, you shall not make, shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout, and then you shall shout. Okay, so that was his instructions. And then on the seventh day, verse 15, they rose early at the dawn of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for what purpose? So that everybody could hear you? No. They are shouting in faith. You shout, for God's already given you the city. Shout believing that God has won the victory. So you can imagine, seven times around in silence, and on the seventh time they hear the blast of the trumpet. And when they hear the blast of the trumpet, in their minds, what are they supposed to be thinking? The battle's already won. The victory is ours. God has given us this victory. And so they shout with a great shout. And what happens? The wall falls down flat all the way around the city except for one teeny tiny little house. I got a lot of questions about that little house. Because that little house belonged to somebody that 
not only wasn't Jewish, but that house belonged to somebody whose house was full of sin. It was a prostitute. And that house was crammed with the family of that prostitute. And God protected that house when the whole rest of the wall fell down around the city. And I can just imagine as Israel watches the wall fall down. And they think, man, this is so cool. All we had to do was march and shout. And yet as they look at that one particular house that's standing, man, God is, God is pretty excited about that person in that house. Why was he excited about her? Because she took him at his word. She believed that God was on their side and he was going to deliver the nation of Israel and she hid the spies and she protected them. And so God protected her and her family. That did not mean that God approved of her lifestyle, did it? This is a side note here, all right? Not in my notes. So often we think sometimes when we love someone who is in sin that it means that we approve of their lifestyle. No, it doesn't. She was a totally changed person, I believe, after this. In fact, you read Jesus' genealogy, guess what? It's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll leave you to read it. But as you go into this and, you, and you, you, like, you feel part of the story, and as I'm reading along in my devotions, I'm like, yes, this is my God. This is the glory that we're talking about. This is the one that I serve. There's a lot in this story to get excited about. I can't just read through this story and yawn, but I turn the page, and the first word in chapter 7, but. I don't, I, don't, I don't like it when the story takes a turn like that, and it starts out, but. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah. In other words, like he's of the tribe of Jesus, just to put it in perspective. He's of the tribe of Jesus, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And I begin to think, now wait a minute. I understand why God would be upset with this person. But it says he's upset with the nation of Israel. With the people that he says he's going to be their God. And then we go on to read what happens. Most of you know the story, but we'll read it anyways. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to him, Go up and spy out the land again, same as we've always done. And the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua, and they said to him, Look, don't have all the people go up, but let two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Don't make all of these armed guys go up there. For they are few. Verse 4, so about 3,000 men went up, from there, went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the, des- at the descent, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And I go, whoa, that came to a screeching halt very, very quickly. God's promise as they entered the promised land is, I will give you the land. The first activity that they engage in goes wonderfully. The second activity that they engage in goes tragically. Now, I get it in the back of his mind, Joshua hears the story of, hey, they don't have many people there. Let's only send up two or 3,000. They send up 3,000. And the expectancy is God was with us when we came to Jericho. God fought our battle in Jericho. 
We now go to AI. And what's the expectancy? God is going to continue to be with us, and we're going to take AI. No matter what we do, God's on our side, so everything's cool. And they send up these 3,000 guys, and they come back running with their tail between their legs. Now, I'm not sure if they tried to, you know, walk around the city again and shout, and it didn't work. I'm not sure what all they tried. It doesn't give us the details there. But it also doesn't mention anything about the fact that they stopped to ask God, okay, so what's next? It just says, Joshua says, okay, here's AI. That's the next thing on the chart. Let's go. And so as these guys go up, 36 of them die, and that doesn't seem like a huge number. They come running back, and it doesn't seem like there's that much really to be that worked up about other than the fact that what? God, you, you said you'd be with us. You said you'd win our battles. It's not happening. Like, they didn't lose a lot of men. They, yeah, they got embarrassed, but it really wasn't that big a deal. But at the end of verse 5, it says, there, The hearts of the people melted and became as water. They're wondering if God had abandoned them. In verse 6, even Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He had, and he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? God, why did you do all this? Like you said, and yet it's not happening. Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Oh Lord, what can I say? When Israel has turned their backs before their enemies, before the Canaanite, Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and will cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? You brought us in here telling us you are a great God, telling us you would fight all of our battles and you can't even fight the second battle. What's going on? And I began thinking in my mind, how many times have I entered into something in life thinking, well, my past has kind of earned me brownie points, so I deserve something before God. I'm going to take this on and see what God does. Then in verse 10, God says to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? In other words, I think God's asking Joshua here, Joshua, oh, why are you accusing me of something that's not my fault? Get up off the ground, face it like a man, and I'll tell you what's going on. Israel has sinned. And I think in my mind, whoa, 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 whoa. Did Israel sin? They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things, and they have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Now, again, we, we know a little bit of the story already. Like, there's one guy that we know of that's taken a little bit, kept it for himself, and God says the whole nation now is in trouble. Is it really that big a deal? I mean, the crazy thing is, the nation of Israel, the whole nation, went into war. They just went into war without knowing anything about what was going on with Achan. They had no knowledge of it. Had they known, like if, if they went into war and they knew somebody in camp maybe had disobeyed God, they probably would have taken care of it. But nobody knew. Is it really that big a deal? It kind of makes me think of the New Testament story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you're familiar with it, they walk in and, and the husband says, you know, I sold my land and here's the money and he dies dead. Okay, well, they cart him off and the wife walks in and did, did you really sell it for this? Yeah, I did. 
Boom, she's dead. And you, you read those stories and you go, man, that seems like a God that I'm not familiar with. And as I'm reading this story, I think of my life, and I think of the times in my life where I, I have tried to hide something from God, and it didn't happen to me. And yet here in this story, I think, this is crazy. Why does God do this to these people? And then I began thinking about what we talked about last week, about Moses not getting able to go into the promised land. And I think these illustrations are a little bit bigger than just these people individually. Both uh, Achan and Ananias and Sapphira were at the beginning of the history of the people of God in two different circumstances. The, the people of God coming into the promised land, God is trying to get his people to understand he's taking sin seriously. He's not to be played with. In his glory, he sees it all. And the same coming into the church, at the beginning of the church, Ananias and Sapphira are doing stuff hidden from everybody else, but God wants his people to know, I see it all. I see it. You can't hide it from me. Back to the end of chapter 4, and I want just to remind you of this. Chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, because it... I think it helps us to be able to put into perspective why this is such a big deal with God. Why doesn't he just overlook it? it? Verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. God did that miracle so that the nation of Israel would learn to fear God from that time on. To say, our God is a God of glory. Our God is a great God who does miraculous things. I need to fear him, not in the sense that I'm afraid of him, but in the sense that I respect him and I will do as he asks. And you get some pretty clear instructions as they go into the land. All right, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of stuff laying around. But this is the first activity that you engage in. And so as the first activity that you engage in, I get the first fruits. And God said, all the stuff that you see laying around, the gold, the silver, all of the good stuff that, that belongs to the people there, the animals, all everything belongs to me. Don't take any of it for yourself because this is the first battle. I fought it for you. I want you to remember this is mine. And one guy says, I deserve some of that. I deserve a little bit of that. And he doesn't tell anybody. He takes it, hides it underneath the, the mat in his house goes out, thinks nobody cares, nobody saw it, nobody understands, sends Israel off to battle. And God has to bring them back. Say, no, I, I do see. I want you to know that I see. I'm not going to let you get away with it. Not so that I can be a mean God and so that I can punish, but so that you understand who I am. So that you understand that I am a God that cares about sin in your life. I'm going to pause for just a second and talk about something that all of us can get excited about. And this is kind of how I'm going to do this here. As, as we look at God, there are a lot of things that get us excited. And one of those things is the omniscience of God. That is something that all of us can, from time to time, say, man, I can get on board with that because I need a God that knows every circumstance that I'm in. He knows everything about that circumstance, no matter where I am, and he knows what to do. He knows all the secrets that my enemies have. He knows how they've been treating me. He knows when I don't know even. He knows everything. We get excited about that. We want to cheer about that. We want to celebrate that. In fact, let's turn to Psalm 139 real quickly. I'm just going to remind you of a couple of places. 
Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before words on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. That is something to celebrate. That God knows everything. The big word there that we use often in church is called omniscient. Our God is omniscient. Romans chapter 11, which we've kind of been using as our launching place here. Who has known the mind of the Lord or been his counselor? There's nobody that gives God advice. That's the kind of God that you and I want to serve. We can get on board with that because we need that in our lives. But here's where the problem comes. We love the fact that no one can outthink our great God. But the other side of that is the omniscience of God means that he also knows my secret world. He also knows those things that I try and hide so that people think I'm better than I really am. And as I read through this, and I began to, to wonder, well, God, why, why, do you do, why do you point this out to the nation? Why, why are you making such a big deal about this? I began to realize that, that God wants me to understand. Not that I, he doesn't want me to be scared of him. Oh, no. God knows everything about me. He knows all my thoughts. But instead, he wants me to be confident in the fact that, yes, he does know everything about me. Yes, that's the kind of God that I serve, but that's a good thing. That's a thing that can be celebrated. Because here's the deal. He knows that he still loves me. He knows that and he still sent Jesus to die in my place. He knows that, and he still offers a relationship with him, a perfect, glorious, omniscient God. When I get caught in my hiding, the first thing that the enemy wants me to do is to accuse God of being bad. To accuse him of being evil, that he just caught me, and man, I, if I could have just gotten away with this, life would have been great. But you know what the great thing is? No, he, he caught me to rescue me from what could be. He caught me because he's a good God. And he's able to know the things that are going to cause me harm in my life. Look real quickly, Jeremiah chapter 17. Most of us know the, the and I'm going to have to have someone read it because I didn't bookmark it here in my Bible and I don't have my phone either for my other Bible. Somebody read me Jeremiah 17 verses 9 and 10. Real loudly, 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things. I, I had it written down here, so I didn't have it bookmarked. <laughs> the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Like if you just, we often hear that verse in isolation. That's depressing, right? My heart is sick. It's desperate for help. Who could know it? If I just stop there, I am in trouble. But what does it go on to say? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. There is one who knows everything, and that is our great God. He knows what's going on in my thoughts even before I think it. He is an omniscient God. And he doesn't want us to view him as 
the God who is immediately going to punish every single thing that we do, and he's just looking for that moment. He wants us to understand that he sees everything in our life that's causing us to get off track and to cause us harm in our life. Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and we need to be reminded of that. And those things that we try and hide in our lives... Don't get mad at God. You know, what if, what if God, um, what if God gave us everything that we deserve? Like, we want God to do that for our enemies. We want God to do that for people that don't treat us right. We want that God to do that for the, the person who passed us up on the job. Like, treat, give them what they deserve. But what if God, like, that's the God that we serve? What would happen? None of us would be sitting here this morning, would we? In fact, this whole earth would be without any human beings on it. Yes, God knows the secret things of our hearts, but it means that we can come to him with those things and be honest with him about those things and say, God, I admit to you my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. I need your help. You already know it. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. I'm just admitting that I need help. God wants from us to take obedience seriously. And we talked about in our men's uh, workshop, and, and, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about several times. Integrity is not even just doing the right things when I'm in secret. Integrity is doing the right thing all the time consistently doing the right thing so that when I face opposition at work and nobody else from church is around, I don't just go off and do my own thing and fit in with the crowd. I still do the right thing. Integrity is about doing the right thing all the time, and God sees all the time. He is still a God who is full of glory. Sometimes he lets us get caught to remind us of that. But he still knows. And yet he's willing to love us. He's willing to forgive us. He's willing to help shape our hearts. Because you and I can't do that on our own. So in these series, like I'm not trying to give you several steps to fix any of the stuff. I'm not convinced that there are several steps to fix it. But here's what I do want you to understand. We serve a great God. And the things that we celebrate when things are going well are the same things that we can celebrate when we're in trouble. When we get a no from God, God is still glorious. When we get caught and we're hiding something in secret, He is still an omniscient God. And guess what? As an omniscient God who knew what we were hiding in secret, that same omniscient God knows exactly what it takes to fix it. He's still omniscient. He's still a God that's worth turning to. So I want to give you some things to take home and think about. Today, there, there are a few questions that you might talk with others about, but it kind of depends on, on how you approach this. If you want to take this real personally and use I instead of we, you may not want to talk about it until you're ready to talk about it. But if you want to use the generic we, feel free. Have discussions, okay? First question, why do we tend to sin even when we know God knows? Like we know that up here and yet we face the temptation and we still say, I choose sin. Why do we do that? Second question, why is sometimes shame more valuable to me than the truth is? I choose to live with shame if I get caught rather than choose to stand with the truth and take whatever's coming. And the last question, is there an area of my life that I believe no one knows about and that I've been protecting? The question there is, what are you going to do about it if there is? Guys, uh, There's help. 
there really is help. There's help in all areas of life. We want to provide that help for you. For men in particular, there's an area that, that a lot of people struggle with. Statistics let us know what happens in the church too with the things that we look at. I want to give you a resource today that is not a pastor, okay? Um, sometimes it's scary to talk to us. Even though Steve and I don't think we're scary, we understand. But there's a guy here that has walked through that and gained victory in that and is willing to share his story with anybody that needs help as well as some material to walk through together. Andrew Smith, you want to write the name down? Look it up in the, in the church directory. If you're struggling with what you're looking at on the internet or what you're buying at magazines or whatever it is, he'd love to have a conversation with you because there's help. And that's not the only area. That's an area that tends to get emphasized because we know so many guys are struggling with it. There are so many other areas. And I want you to know today, whatever area it is, you're not alone. There are people sitting here today who have gone through what you've gone through, who have struggled through addictions, who have struggled through thoughts about, God, I, I can't be who I am in my heart with everyone else, and you present to everyone else as a phony. People that have figured out, God, you want me to be authentic. You want me to be real. Here's how I can do that. And if you want some help, man, we would love to be able to help you. We're not just here so that we can have a bunch more people in the seats and entertain people every week. We want you to know that this God that we serve is worth serving. He wants to help us to gain victory, not so that we look good, so that we you know, are squeaky clean on the outside. He wants us to, to know that we can have victory in our lives to bring glory to him as a God full of glory as a God that's worthy of every single person out there saying, man, I need to give my life to him. And this morning, if you are here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to understand he knows who you are. He knows everything about you. But that's a good thing because he sent Jesus Christ to take your place on the cross. He paid the price for your sin in order that you might be given a relationship with God the Father. He loves you. And he did that so that you would be able to say, I admit, I, I admit my heart is wicked. I admit it's deceitful even to myself. I didn't even understand how bad I am. But I admit that I need help. I admit that Jesus needs to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus promised if you will do that, he will offer you a totally new life. He'll give you a new life that begins right now and lasts for all of eternity. If you're here this morning, if you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd invite you to do that today. And maybe if you came with somebody, let them know that. It doesn't take a magical prayer or anything like that. It takes admitting to him and, and him alone. But it also takes sometimes some people around us saying, okay, so what do I do next? Tell the person that brought you. Steve and I, would love to be able to talk to you, but we want to be able to help. So we're going to keep talking through some of this stuff, some of these things that sometimes get us discouraged and get us frustrated and cause us to walk away from God. I just want to present to you a part of God that ought to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to turn back to him. Like I got a little sidetracked here, but I see him for who he is now, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. God, Thank you so much for being a God that's worthy of worship. Thank you for being an omniscient God, a God that knows everything about everything that we ever encounter in life. Thank you for being a God that knows my heart, that knows the things that I try and hide. And thank you as well, God, that you, you understand the solution, that I'm not left alone to figure out a way out. God, in the middle of our mess, we just want to worship you. We want to turn back to you. So God, forgive us for hiding things in our lives. Help us to recognize that it's a good thing when those things get found out. God, may we turn back to you. In Jesus' name.
the first step of responding is admitting that we need some help and 